Hey carnivores, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. I hope you all are having a good a day. As always, update me down below in the comment section on how you guys are doing on your carnivore journey. Also, feel free to follow me on Instagram at Steak and Butter Gal for more carnivore content, tips and tricks, and what I eat on the daily. Today's video features Dr. Al Dannenberg. He is a periodontist and he has been practicing for 44 years. Towards the end of his practice, he was diagnosed with an uncurable, deadly cancer. And his doctor told him he had three three to six months to live. Dr. Al is going to share all the details about his story, his healing journey, and what changes to his diet and nutrition he made to make such huge impacts in his overall health. We also talk about the importance of oral health and its connection to our microbiome and Dr. Al's recommendations for the best dental care routine. I did want to announce that Dr. Al will be a guest speaker for the month of July. I host 30 day carnivore challenges every single month in hopes of helping you guys get on track, stay on track and get to your goals. Within these 30 day challenges every month, I host eight hours of live zoom calls every single week. And I always feature the most brilliant minds in the carnivore community. So Dr. Al is going to be one of the guest speakers coming on in July. I will also be inviting on Dr. Philip Ovidia, Sally K. Norton, Rebecca Farmer, and Professor Bart K. So if you would like to attend the live Zoom call Q&A with Dr. Al and all of the other guest speaker calls, as well as all 32 hours of live Zoom calls with me and my coaches, feel free to sign up for the next 30-day carnivore challenge at svgmeetup.com or check out the links down below in the description box to directly sign up. So without further ado, let me invite on my guest, Dr. Al. Hi, Dr. Al. How are you doing today? Hey, how are you? I'm great. Nice to see you. And thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. It's my honor. I'm so excited that you're here. Something that is so fascinating about your story. In 2018, you were diagnosed with an incurable cancer. Your doctor told you you had three to six months to live. And what I find so remarkable is that you rejected chemotherapy. I would love for you to share the details about your story, why you rejected chemotherapy, and what did you do to get to where you are today? Wow. So how much time do we have? Sometimes I have diarrhea of the mouth. Uh, so if, if that's any point you need to stop me, that's not a problem. So let's start kind of um, at the point where I knew I had a problem. April 2018, I was 71 years old at the time. I was doing really well. I thought I was basically a poster boy for senior healthy living. I was writing, I was lecturing, and actually I was going to Austin, Texas to speak at the Paleo FX meeting. And while I was traveling, I noticed that my shoulder got very sore. I usually carry a bag on my shoulder and it got very sore and it wasn't very usual for that to happen. So it was concerning to me. I'm kind of wussy. I don't like any discomfort. And so it persisted. I went to the meeting. I did my stuff. I went home. And over the next several months, the shoulder pain progressed to my back and then progressed to my chest. And finally, I'm a little pig headed. Finally, I got uh, a notion, maybe I need to see my doc. So, you know, my physician, I've seen him for 30 plus years. I call him, he sets up an appointment. He looks at me, he says, yeah, it looks like there's something wrong, obviously. And he does some blood work. The blood work comes back normally, which is interesting, relatively normal. He says one of the tests that he did was a high sensitivity C-reactive protein, indicating maybe systemic inflammation. Well, normally when I've had that test done, it's always less than 0 0.5, which is pretty healthy. This was over 5, 5.0. Obviously something was going on and he suggested I do an MRI and the MRI showed either a lymphoma a leukemia or multiple myeloma. Oh my God, here I am, 71 years old, eating a healthy paleo-ish type of diet and lifestyle for the last six or so years, feeling fantastic. And now my doc is telling me I have cancer. My world is crumbling here. So he schedules an appointment with an oncologist who I don't know, turns out to be a phenomenal man, and he's still my oncologist today. So I meet with him. My wife is there. My adult kids are there. And they do a whole bunch of tests before I meet with him. And the bottom line is I have incurable IgA kappa light chain multiple myeloma, which is a type of bone marrow cancer, 
with innumerable lytic lesions throughout my body, meaning I have all kinds of holes throughout my skeleton, almost like a person with severe osteoporosis. Not the same, but almost like that, meaning my bones are fragile. If I bend or twist in the wrong direction, I could crack a bone. And what was happening was I had several cracked ribs. I had several broken ribs, a, a hairline fracture in my pelvis and a vertebral compression fracture. This is what caused me the pain. That's why I went to the doc. Turns out that he says that because this is what it is, he felt like I had three to six months to live unless I did chemo. And I said, well, why would I do chemo if this is in an incurable bone marrow cancer? I mean, I'm going to die. Why would I put this this chemical in my body to destroy the immune system, which is already compromised by my multiple myeloma and then deteriorate and then die? Why would I do that to myself? It didn't make sense. He actually agreed with me. And so I rejected chemotherapy. I created what now is 11 unconventional cancer protocols that I follow on a daily basis. And it did extremely well. I didn't get better. I never got worse. Never, ever have I been in remission, but I was doing quite well. So now fast forward, maybe a year. Hmm. It's August of 2019. Now, I just mentioned my bones are fragile, right? Yes. And I've had little pathological fractures along the way. So I am standing in my bathroom, brushing and flossing my teeth, which I think I know how to do. And I'm standing and I'm getting ready to throw away my dental floss. So I twist to the left about 90 degrees to throw my floss away in the trash can in the bathroom. Immediately, my right femur snaps in half. I crash to the floor, break a couple more ribs, and my right humerus fra fractures in half. Mm. So my major bones on this right side of my body have just fractured. I didn't know that, but I could see when I'm looking at my body laying on the ground that my limbs are in positions I can never bend them. Wow. So I'm in a little bit of pain, right? So I'm screaming. My wife is coming in. We call EMS, emergency, you know, uh, ambulance gets me to the hospital and they fix my right femur. Now, let me just tell you that everybody I know at that age group, in that age group, that fractures, just fractures their, their hip. They die in months, you know? I'm figuring I had three to six months to live. I've already lived a year. Yeah. And so... I'm ready to die and I want to die. When they fix my right femur, they do that because I could bleed out because of a, a punctured femoral artery, but they don't fix my right arm. And of course they don't do anything for ribs. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually placed in a hospice hospital to die. Now in September, 2019, just a couple more months after that, when once I've gotten into the hospital, there is a hurricane approaching Charleston, South Carolina, where I live. And it's a dead ringer for the hospital where I am at at that moment. So the hospital staff is ordered to evacuate all their patients. They don't know where to put me, which is not unusual. And my wife is an RN and she decides to get a hospital bed in the house mm. and they bring me to the house. I'm still under hospice. But my wife is amazing. I mean, she's an amazing woman. And she literally feeds me some tough love without beating me up and bruising me. She is emotionally feeding me a whole bunch of tough love. Mm -hmm. And she basically says, look, you've done well with these unconventional cancer protocols until now. Mm -hmm. Let's get a physical therapist. Let's get you better. And let's see if you can get on these protocols again and, and, and recover. So actually that happens. We get the physical therapist in. I get my catheter out. I've actually been on a catheter for 30 days. You have no idea. And then he gets me, the physical therapist helps me get out of bed, walking with a walker. And eventually I do well. And I reject hospice, revoke hospice, end hospice, and go back to my oncologist the following month in October. And he is amazed I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. So he then suggests that I do maybe a 
immunotherapy drug, which is not chemo. It's a monoclonal antibody, theoretically to kill some malignant plasma cells, which is my malignancy. I get results with that. But in May of 2020, I have a new PET scan, which is an x-ray of whole body looking for cancer cells. And there is no active cancer cells in my body. Now, understand a PET scan only looks for moderate to advanced cancer cells. Can't really see very small ones. So it's not telling me I'm in remission, but I've never had a negative PET scan before. And I'm feeling fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So then we can fast forward until June of 2021. And my immunotherapy, which is a successful monoclonal antibody to do what it's supposed to do, is starting to give me some side effects. And my oncologist suggests, let's maybe stop the immunotherapy. At that time, I catch COVID. Oh. And COVID really puts me under. I never had to go to the hospital, never had to be on medications because I've been able to really improve my immune system, which is pretty impressive because my disease destroys my immune system. I had developed a number of issues because of the COVID that activated more active myeloma cells, and I had more activity on a new PET scan. Mm. And that's where I am today. I'm recovering. I am getting back, certainly back into my unconventional cancer protocols. And I expect all of this to come back under control. Again, I have never been in remission. I do not have a cure for cancer, but I do have methods that are very natural to support the immune system to make it as robust as possible. And that's, that's what I do. Wow. You are fantastic. Just that story gives me goosebumps. I'm sure all of the viewers watching right now, uh, they're all wondering, okay, so what is the unconventional cancer protocols that you were talking about? So I think there's a perfect time for you to dive into that. Sure. So I list my unconventional cancer protocols right on my homepage on my website. Anybody can download it. And I link to everything I do and take. There are many, many cited medical references to support what I try to do. So my key element in all of this is a carnivore and carnivore-ish diet. Before I was diagnosed, I basically was on a paleo-type diet for about six years before 2018. When I was diagnosed, I changed my paleo-type diet to a paleo autoimmune diet, basically eliminating nightshades and maybe a few other little things. In January of 2020, I had already discovered the benefits of a carnivore, strict carnivore diet. Much of my information came from the Paleo Medicina Clinic in Budapest, Hungary, where these physicians, they have treated over 6,000 patients that have severe chronic disease, and various types of cancer. And they treat them with a very strict carnivore diet with no supplementation and no prescription drugs. That's very, very important here. And when I was reading this information, it so impressed me and the research and the results were mind boggling. I immediately started a strict carnivore diet, January 1st, 2020 and continued with that strict diet for about a year. Since then, I have gone more carnivore-ish, maybe 80 to 90% animal-based nose to tail, and maybe some, certainly some honey, some fruits, and extremely rarely some vegetables that are very low in oxalates, lectins, or phytates, which are anti-nutrients. I think that is a critical element to my protocol. When I say a carnivore, strict carnivore diet, it is a high fat, moderate protein, low carb diet. You need to eat not just the muscle meat, you need to eat the organs and you need to eat the animal fat, the cartilage. You need to eat the animal nose to tail because there are elements in the organs and the cartilage and the bone marrow and the fat to supplement and complement and sometimes offset the excess proteins that are in the muscle meat. In addition, the meat 
should be ideally ruminant animals, red meat, beef and lamb, obviously grass fed, grass finished, organic grasses. I mean, no chemicals involved, no antibiotics, you know, no preservatives of any type in, in these foods. That's what the ideal situation would be. And I think that's critical to help the body heal itself. And of course, the elimination of anything that is irritating to the gut microbiome is a, a big factor. But that major protocol is my way of eating. Yes. And I do have some follow-up questions. Any sure. particular organs you recommend? Yes. Yes. I recommend a combination of the basic bovine organs, usually pancreas, heart, liver, kidney, spleen. They're generally in one big complex of capsules. Then I recommend bone marrow, which is another type of nutrient system. And I, you know, when I, I can actually purchase um, grass fed, grass fit, finished bone marrow bones, which are phenomenal. But when I don't, the desiccated organs suffice. Yep. And then I recommend cartilage from the throat area of the cattle rather than just hooves, because it's, it, you get better and healthier collagen from the throat area of the cattle. So the collagen, the bone marrow, and the assembly of various organs. Yeah, I had a whole phase where I ate as many organs as I could, as much variety in organs. I actually had it raw. So I'm just curious, do, do you find that the absorption or the nutrient density is greater when you eat it raw versus cooked? Oh, I am sure it's better raw than cooked. I know that many researchers have reported on some of the indigenous primal societies in existence today. They're very few, but they will go hunting and they'll gut the animal in the field and immediately eat the river still hot, uh -huh. hot from the body. Uh, I think raw is perfect. Do I do it raw? I don't. Sorry, I just don't. It's <laughs> it's not convenient for me. In all honesty, the flavor of bovine liver is a little more copperish that I don't like, although it's healthy, but I do it in desiccated form. If you eat desiccated organs, these are coming from grass fed, grass finished animals, dehydrated in a fashion that's not disturbing the enzymatic activity of the rest of the nutrients. So the only thing that's removed from these organs is the water. So it's a very healthy source to get the benefit of the organ in your normal daily diet. Should vitamin A toxicity be a concern for those who eat organs? Everything I read is no. If your retinol is coming from the animal itself and not extracted as a supplement, don't forget when you're eating these vitamins and minerals and everything else, you're getting them in proper ratios in a bioavailable form. And I'm not telling you to eat two pounds of liver a day either. And everything that I read and listen to suggests that you're not going to have a problem with vitamin A retinol from the actual source as long as it is in its natural symbiotic relationship with all the other nutrients. Another option to get in organs that I would love to recommend is carnivore crisps. They have liver and heart chips. So if you are looking for a delicious crunch that's salty, healthy, high quality and tasty, and a way to get in your organs easily without that gross aftertaste, Carnivore Crisp is an excellent option. Here is a look at the Beef Liver Crisp. As you can see, they're very thin, delicate, dehydrated chips. Brisket, beef heart, chicken breast. So you guys can check out Carnivore Crisps at carnivorecrisps.com and you can use my discount code SBGAL for unlimited discounts on all of your purchases. So you mentioned you recently incorporated back some fruits, plants, low in oxalates. I would firstly love to know the reason why. Is it for variety's sake? So I have a philosophy. Yes. My philosophy is our human species were not carnivores 100% of the time. Now, research shows 
we're omnivores leaning heavily to being a carnivore, but we also consume some plants. I think the human species is, if it's healthy, is metabolically flexible. What that means is we are able to burn fat as a fuel, which is an ideal method to gain energy, but also we have the mechanism which is critical to burn carbohydrates. And if we don't do that, it's almost like turning off a normal mechanism or a normal pathway that is critical for the body. So what I do is I prepare my meals, let's say on a weekly basis, to be in a state of a fat burner, let's say five to six days a week, and a carb burner maybe two days a week. So when I'm a fat burner, obviously, I'm not eating fruits or anything that it actually throws me out of ketosis. As a carnivore, in my fat burning days of the week, I will eat relatively 100% or 98%, 95% meat, animal products, no to tail. But any carbs that I in introduce do not put me out of or do not throw me out of ketosis. So I can actually eat a, uh, I could eat a tablespoon of Manuka honey, which has only 17 carbs. And I know that I don't throw myself out of ketosis because I, I measure my breath uh, ketones all the time. But if I ate a tablespoon of honey and two bananas, I'm out of ketosis, right? So what I do is I force myself to eat a diet that has maybe 150 to 200 grams of carbs one or two days a week to make me metabolically flexible and be a carb burner as our primal ancestors have evolved for two and a half million years. Mm -hmm. And I do that with some of the fruits, some honey. And if I do any vegetables, it's very, very rare. Maybe some romaine lettuce, maybe some mushrooms, maybe some onions, but still the, the volume is minimal. Again, I'm trying to be a car burner a day or two a week and a fat burner five to six days a week. Oh. And what about someone who is currently going through intense sugar cravings? So they're adapting to carnivore. Would it be a good idea for them to introduce these carb burning days? So I, that's a great question. So you have to create the metabolic flexibility first. You have to become a fat burner before you can start becoming a carb burner. So if you are a carb burner, you're addicted to carbohydrates, you're not there yet. You need to be much more strict. You need to understand what ketosis is. You need to get into ketosis. For some people, you can become an efficient fat burner in a week or two. Some people may take two or three months. There's a variety of factors, I'm sure, that are involved, some genetics, some psychological, whatever it may be, the, the history of your eating lifestyle, your, your activity level, your stress level, um, your sleep patterns, uh, all of these things have to play a part. But you need to become a well-defined fat burner, knowing that you're in ketosis. So you have to measure. You, you don't know you're in ketosis unless you measure that. Now, I know I'm in ketosis because I know what it feels like compared to being in a, a, a car burner. When you're in ketosis, you might know this yourself, you have really a lot extra energy. You have real clarity of, in, of your mind. You can see the, the clarity improve when you're in ketosis, certainly the energy level. Um, so I know that, but I always measure with a breath ketone meter. The breath ketone meter that I use is very accurate from the research that I've read, and it, it doesn't register the ketones in the blood. It registers the acetone that is blown off after the ketones are produced, and there is a correlation to the breath acetone level to the blood ketone level. Back to your unconventional cancer protocol. So 
besides the nutritional aspect, what other things did you do to improve your health? Nutrition is number one, but a very close runner up is good gut health. It is critical that you have a diversity of microbiome in your gut, meaning that you have many, many, many different species of microbes and many numbers of each of these species. And the reason is that the research strongly suggests that that microbiome, if it's very diverse, will crowd out potentially pathogenic species that could maybe overgrow and damage the gut garden of bacteria. So that's critical. You need to make sure that the lining of the gut is intact so that you don't have what's called a leaky gut. I would say at least 85 to 90% of the US population has a leaky gut. And I'll say that for a variety of reasons. Number one, there was a study that was published a couple of years ago that showed 88% of the US population has metabolic dysfunction. Well, to have metabolic dysfunction, you have to have leakage through the epithelial barrier in the gut to get into the systemic circulation. In addition, you have to have a healthy mouth. Now, this is very interesting, and most people don't get it. Even biological dentists don't get it. Most infection and inflammation in the mouth, unless it's iatrogenic dentistry, meaning poorly placed fillings or partials or irritants in the mouth that damage the mouth. So let's assume that's not the case. Most inflammation and infection in the mouth starts in the gut. When the gut is disturbed because of dysbiosis and the epithelial barrier is dysfunctional and it leaks toxic elements, especially lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream. It gets into every organ system in the body and the immune system starts its dysfunctional method to reduce the inflammation, but it's not successful. I mean, it tries and it develops chronic systemic inflammation. The mouth is an organ system that reacts to all of this. Now, the mouth has its own microbiome, maybe 700 or so microbes that we know of today. And that microbiome stays in a state of balance based on the foods that we eat, the health of the gut, and the health of the immune system. When those things start to break down, the microbiome in the mouth breaks down, and pathogenic species create an overgrow to form gum disease and tooth decay. Once that occurs, infection under the gum can pass through the tissues into the bone, destroying the bone, into the capillaries, getting into the, the systemic circulation, and it becomes its own nidus of infection like the gut. So you have a leaky gut and you like have a leaky gum pocket. And both of those can contribute to many systemic chronic diseases, including cancer. Even if you had a failing root canal, which is a very serious problem, or extractions that may, may have not been done correctly where there is residual infection or irritants embedded in the bone that has healed around it can be a factor in systemic infection, inflammation, and chronic disease and cancer. So you have to have this healthy gut, you have to have this healthy mouth, and you have to have this nutritious, healthy diet. These are three critical elements. What is your position on fluoride oral hygiene products? No. Next question. No, I'll give you an answer. So fluoride, fluoride has been shown without a doubt to reduce tooth decay if it's applied topically in the mouth. It is a barrier. It is a Band-Aid. It may be protective, but there are many other biological processes that are disturbed 
when fluoride is introduced into the system. My rationale is this. Why would you put a chemical that has potential toxicity, which it does, when there is a better way, a natural way to prevent tooth decay? And that is to have a healthy oral hygiene program, the way you clean your mouth. And you can link to a a PDF that I have that talks about four steps to a healthy mouth, obviously not using fluoride or any other chemicals. And a healthy gut microbiome, because again, the microbiome affects the immune system that affects the health of the bacteria in the mouth. And if you do these things and eat the right diet, you will not get tooth decay. End of story. If you look at the prehistoric man, at least the oldest is 300,000 years old. In this 300,000 year old skeleton, this guy or gal, can't tell who, which is which, but let's say this is a guy, he has all 16 of his lower teeth, meaning that he's probably at least 18 to 20, 21 years old. The surfaces of the teeth in his lower jaw are very worn down. So he's been eating lots of hard foods, probably chewing on bones, um, and he's worn down his teeth. So that may make him at least 25, 35 years old. There are no signs of tooth decay. All the teeth are intact. There are no signs of jawbone destruction. They have, in, in other words, no gum disease. There is junk between the teeth, and that junk is tartar dental plaque that has calcified. So he's had dental plaque. He's had bacteria, but no tooth decay and no gum uh, gum disease or bone loss. Why is that? Because everything was in a state of balance. No infection developed. You don't need fluoride to stop tooth decay. If you are unhealthy and do all the wrong things, you can use it as a Band-Aid but it makes no sense. If you had ants crawling on your floor in the house, you could kill them by burning down the house. Does that make sense? What about fluoride in water? Would you recommend getting filters? Well, I definitely do not recommend drinking fluoride in water. First of all, the studies clearly show, if you look at the the well-controlled studies, is that fluoridated water has no real reference to tooth decay and who knows how much you're drinking and who knows how much fluoride is actually in that water. And there are many, many studies that show that systemic fluoride is neurotoxic. Many studies have shown a reduce in IQ of children that have have been drinking water at a young age, even mothers that have been drinking water, fluoride water at uh, in pregnancy. It has an effect on the thyroid gland because of iodine and fluoride compete with one another. So there is no reason that there should be fluoride in your drinking water. And I do agree if you have water that you can filter out the fluoride, you want to do that. My goal, which I do, is I drink natural spring water. Does mouth breathing affect our oral health? Yes. When you mouth breathe, you dry out the mucosal tissues and bacteria have a chance to really grow rapidly and crazy. So what you can do if you mouth breathe is to determine why you mouth breathe. Now, if you're used to breathing through your mouth and you can and should be breathing through your nose, what you could do is do what's called mouth taping. You can tape, that's kind of silly to think about it, but you can get a piece of tape, paper tape. I think um, uh, 3M makes a, uh, a, a paper type of tape where you take the tape and literally tape your mouth shut from side to side. Now, you'll put little wings on the sides of the tape, like fold it over so that if you want to remove it, you just pull it off. Now, when you do that, if your nose is able and has good breathing ca- capacity, You'll breathe through your nose, not through your mouth, and that'll take care of the problem. It may retrain you to breathe through your nose and everything is great. And then you won't have to do taping anymore. 
And you know that because the next morning, if you don't use the tape, your mouth is not dry. However, a lot of times people breathe through their mouth because they gasp for air because they have some obstruction in their airway. And that could be a result of a variety of things. So if you were to use mouth taping and in the middle of the night, you literally had to pull it out off the uh, pull the tape off to breathe. That's an indication that you may have some kind of uh, sleep apnea, obstruction in your uh, uh, ability to breathe in your airway space. And you need to have that tested from a medical doctor that does testing for uh, sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea, that has to be treated. A variety of techniques to treat it. A lot of times it's related to orthodontics that are not done well or poor development of the jaw. And all of that could actually be corrected over time, maybe a couple of years, uh, and prevent the need for a CPAP machine. So there are many ways to do that, but mouth taping is a good indicator to tell you maybe you have sleep apnea or maybe you have a habit of mouth breathing that you can correct and start breathing through your nose normally without any airway obstruction. It does damage the microbiome in the mouth and you really don't want to have a dry mouth. What is proper dental care and do you recommend mouthwash? Proper dental care really means to remove unhealthy deposits of bacterial biofilms or clumps. So what does that mean? I will tell you this. Dental plaque is healthy. You do not want to remove dental plaque if it's healthy. Dental plaque is a natural, healthy biofilm. And let me go into this a little bit before I get into your question. If you look at the body, think about where there is a hard structure that penetrates skin tissue and embeds itself into sterile tissue. In my way of thinking, there is only one area, and that's the tooth. The tooth is a hard hydroxyapatite and other mineralized structure that penetrates the epithelial tissue, the, the gum tissue, and literally embeds itself into sterile bone. If you had bacteria in your mouth, which everybody has, that bacteria would have a, a field day in clumping onto this wet, dark, slippery surface and sliding down the tooth, going right into the bone, and then it would eat the bone away, your jaw would necrose and you would die. Now that doesn't happen. And there are many reasons why. One of the major reasons is that there's this very strong immune system and immune system white blood cells under the gum in the bone area to kill anything that wants to get in there. That's very important. But there is another superficial layer that is the, the, the earliest protector, and that's the dental plaque. So the dental plaque is made up of two to 300 understood microbes, but there may be many others, but two to 300 bacteria and other microbes in this garden of dental plaque. The dental plaque actually provides three important purposes. One is that it maintains a pH level of 5.5. Now, pH of 5.5 doesn't cause tooth decay, but it actually prevents potentially pathogenic bacteria from getting into the root of the tooth. So the pH of 5.5 helps to prevent decay on the tooth. And it is a gatekeeper also for nutrients in the saliva, minerals, that can get into the root surface through the dental plaque to remineralize the tooth 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So dental plaque is critical. If you don't have dental plaque, you don't have the protection of the hydrogen peroxide, you don't have the protection of the neutralizing pH value, and you don't have this method to 
control the minerals that go into the root. And the purpose to clean your mouth is if there is any overgrowth of bad bacteria, you want to remove it. And how do you do it? Well, I have this, these four steps to a healthy mouth that you can send to any of your viewers, but basically they do this. Number one, you want to brush your teeth on the cheek surface and tongue surface at the gum line with a soft bristle brush, not aggressively, just gently. You want to clean between the teeth. Now you want to use dental floss to go between the contacts of the teeth to actually remove any fibrous material that's stuck between the teeth. But you don't want to take the dental floss and go under the gum because it's easy to cut the gum and damage the gum. Where the gum meets the tooth between the teeth, the best way to clean that are with little interdental cleaners. One of the ones that I like the best is called a Tepe, T-E-P-E, Easy Pick. These are little silicone toothpicks almost that are very gentle, but they clean the surface where the gum meets the tooth. It will only remove the unhealthy dental plaque. It doesn't scrub off the underlying healthy dental plaque. You also want to clean the surface of your tongue. 80% of bad odor comes from the surface of the tongue where there, are, are, there is an overgrowth of anaerobic bacteria as well as decaying food particles. So you can clean it with a tongue scraper or you can use an inverted teaspoon, put it all the way back on your tongue just to the point where you want to gag, scrape the spoon forward and you'll have a little milky fluid that you'll see in the bowl of the spoon. Do that a couple, you know, once in a couple of times, first in the morning at night and then at night. And that fluid is the unhealthy anaerobic bacteria as well as decaying food particles. So that's the way to clean your mouth. Do not use a mouthwash on a daily basis. Mouthwashes are antimicrobial. They kill some bad guys and all the good guys too. You don't want to kill the bacteria. You want to enhance the balance of the microbiome so that potentially pathogenic bacteria get crowded out. Do not use toothpaste that's antimicrobial on a daily basis. Don't use chemicals in toothpaste like xylitol or bentonite clay or activated charcoal or fluoride in toothpaste. You don't even have to use toothpaste. You could dip your toothpaste and a little salt water and maybe a little baking soda. Now, baking soda is good because baking soda is not very caustic, not very abrasive, I mean. It will remove some food stains on the tooth, and it has a neutralizing effect. If you've eaten some very acidy foods, it will help neutralize it so that it's not very acid at the moment. But definitely nothing that has antimicrobial activity on a daily basis. I will link everything Dr. Al mentioned in the description box, all links to his articles, uh, sharing his protocols down below. So please check it out. So I will wrap up with this last question, not periodontal or oral health related, but something that I would love to know during the time period where you were told you had three to six months left to live. What gave you hope? How important was mindset to you during that time? Everything everything. Let, let me give you a little bit about me. I am not a religious person, but I am amazingly spiritual. I believe in our soul. Actually, this is going to go against a lot of people that are listening, I'm sure. I believe our soul comes into our physical body to learn lessons. And those lessons we decide on before we even incarnate. And I do believe we come back more than one time, probably many, many, many times to learn many, many lessons. I believe that I have this challenge in life to understand, learn from it, get better and share with whomever wants the knowledge that I have acquired. I can tell you this. You can't find the information that I've experienced from any oncologist ever, 
At least I've never experienced that. My oncologist tells me he's amazed that I'm still alive. He is a conventional oncologist. He could never recommend what I do to any of his patients, or he'd probably be fired from his group practice and the medical licensing board would probably not renew his license next time around because it's out of the standard of care. People don't know what they don't know. They don't know how to do some outside of the box research. And my mindset was, I know, I think I know that I'm here to learn. And I think the body is an amazing mechanism that knows how to heal itself. We're all going to die. That's not the question. The question is, if we are ill, it's probably something we either did to our body or we're not putting into our body what it needs. I don't believe in synthetic supplements because they're all highly processed. I don't believe in chemical methods to help have a healthy body. Now, therapeutically, different things may need to be done for a short period of time, but I don't believe that the human being needs supplementation to stay alive uh, like a vegan might, because vegans cannot stay alive if they don't have certain supplements. They, they deteriorate. So the question is, mindset, absolutely. And my spiritual feeling, I think, has been extremely important. My other very, very supporting um, a pillar has been my wife. Someone in a condition like that like myself, needs to have an individual that they have complete confidence in that can support what they do, um, suffer with them and 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 cheer with them when things go well. And I think that's very, very important to have success. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Al, for spending this time with me, sharing your knowledge with me and the audience watching. Where can people find you if they would like to get coaching from you? Is that a possibility? Absolutely. I do a 12-week coaching program. There's a lot of information on my website. So it's drdannenberg.com. So it is D-R-D-A-N-E-N-B-E-R-G.com. There's so much that you can download and there is a contact information bar or the navigation bar where anybody can email me through that contact. And I answer all my emails personally within 24 hours. Thank you, Dr. Al. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Hey, carnivores. Thank you so much for watching to the very end. If you did enjoy the conversation, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Also, feel free to share this video with friends, family, and coworkers if you'd like. If you would like to learn more from Dr. Al Dannenberg and ask him your personal questions live on Zoom, Dr. Al will be a guest speaker in my July 30-day carnivore challenge. So you guys can sign up, get into the community early, get pumped up, start accessing the 24-7 chat boxes before we officially kick off off in July. You will have access to Dr. Al's guest speaker meeting, Dr. Philip Ovedia's guest speaker meeting, Sally K. Norton's, Rebecca Farmer's, and Professor Bart K. It's going to be an amazing month of learning, enlightenment, and connection. For more details on the Steak and Butter Gang 30-Day Carnivore Challenges, please go to spgmeetup.com or check out the link down below in the description box to read more details and directly sign up. I hope you guys have a beautiful rest of your week. I will see you guys in the next video. Have a good day.